So in Algebra 2, we learn to multiply complex numbers together using distributive property, or like FOIL we call it sometimes. 3 times 5 is 15. 3 times 12i is 36i. That's the outers. The inners is 4i plus 5 is 20i. And the last are plus 48i squared. But i squared is the same thing as negative 1. So it's minus 48. And 15 minus 48 is negative 33. And 36 plus 20 is 56. What I want to show you in this video is that there's a relationship between the two things that get multiplied together and the answer. It's sort of a predictable relationship between those three things. Just looking at the graphs of 3 plus 4i, 5 plus 12i, and 33 plus 56i, you don't, there's nothing that seems obvious about how these two things, this is not drawn to scale, but there's no obvious thing just looking at it. But if I turn these numbers into polar form, 3 plus 4i turns into 5 cosine 53.1 plus 5i sine 53.1. Whereas the uh, 5 plus 12i, that turns into 13 cosine 67.4 plus 13i sine 67.4. And if I take the answer and turn that into complex form or into polar form also, that one turns to 65 cosine 120.5 plus 65i sine 120.5. And notice how 5 and 13 together multiply and become 65, whereas 53 plus 67.4 is 120.5. Well, that's not an accident, and it's called the multiplication rule, and it goes like this, that if you have two numbers that are in polar form already, like if I already knew I had 5 cosine 53.1 plus 5i sine 53.1 and I wanted to multiply it by 13 cosine 67.4 plus 13i sine 67.4 if they're in this form the answer is also going to be in this form and the r value is just going to be the product of 5 times 13 which in this case is 65 Whereas the theta value is going to be the sum of 53 and 67.4, which is 120.5. And that's called the multiplication rule. And we could use it. I can make up questions, you know, 2 cosine 20 plus 2i sine 20 times 4 cosine 40 plus i sine 40. Fits the form. So 2 times 4 is 8. Cosine. I don't need the. I don't need the parentheses because only one number. Eight cosine plus eight i sine, and the angle is just the sum of twenty and forty, so sixty. Sixty. This isn't the neatest thing I ever wrote in my life. Uh, cosine sixty squared three over two, so this is eight times square root of 3 over 2, and sine sin 60, sorry, cosine 60 is 1 half, so this becomes 4, sine 60 is radical 3 over 2, so this becomes 8 radical 3 over 2i, 4, 4, plus 4 root 3i, we usually put the i in between, so we don't think that it's part of the, underneath the radical, underneath that radical. So that's the multiplication rule. Now there are several proofs of the multiplication rule. I'm going to show you one that does not involve trigonometry, although it's a little hard to visualize this one. But I'm going to show this one to you anyway. Okay. 
So what I have here is two complex numbers, the endpoints of these are. i um, just going to make up numbers. Let's say this is 4 plus i, and this is 3 plus 4i. Now, I have some right triangles here, like this one down here is 4 and 1. And for its hypotenuse, oh, and I'm going to call these numbers z little 1 and z subscript 2. I'm going to call this hypotenuse, even though we know that it's the square root of 17, let's just call it absolute value z1, it's like the, the length of it. Now this other triangle, this one here, it has 3 and 4, and I'm going to call it, even though we know this is 5, I'm going to call it absolute value z2, but it is 5. Now, if I do 3 plus 4i times 4 plus i, I could do a little distributor property thing here and get 3 plus 4i times 4 plus 3 plus 4i times i. Now, 3 plus 4 i times 4 is a dilation by a factor of 4. So it's be this big kind of line here. And 3 plus 4i times i is a is a rotation of this by 90 degrees. And if it was an i, but it was like 2i or something, it would also have um, a dilation. And when I add these two things together, what ends up happening, I get the sum, which is also the product of these two things. Geometrically speaking, it's the diagonal of this parallelogram. So this is the answer, this green thing is the answer. Well, that is part of a nice big right triangle. This is a right angle because this whole thing is a rectangle. So I want to examine that triangle. I want to prove that it's similar to this triangle here. Let's look at the lengths of these different sides. Like this, this side over here, this big red side, its length it was it was three plus four i times times uh, times four. It was this hypotenuse of this 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 triangle here, which was five times four, which is twenty. So that length is is twenty, but let's just call it four times absolute value z two. That's that's the length, four times five. On the other hand. This blue line up here, which is the same as this blue line down there, that one is its length. It's the same length as um, as this line segment here, the part, the three, 3 plus 4i length. So it's just 5. Or in other words, it's uh, 1 times absolute value z2. So notice how this little triangle down here is 4, 1, right angle, and this one is 4 times something, 1 times something, right angle. That makes these two triangles similar, this one and this one. Well, if they're similar, that means that this angle has to equal that angle here. Maybe I should erase that a little bit. This angle here is equal to this angle here. Well, that means that this entire angle is going to be the yellow angle, sorry, the yellow angle plus this angle, which was the angle from the 3, 4, 5 triangle. In other words, the, the sum of the two angles. Finally, the length of this green hypotenuse. 
Well, we know what that has to be, because if this triangle here is similar to this triangle down here, and the sides are, instead of being 4, 1, like in the small triangles, 4 times z2 absolute value and 1 times absolute value z2, that means that this side must be scaled up by that same z2, but its original length was z1. And that actually proves the rule that the product of two complex numbers, uh, the answer is the sum of the two angles for the individual complex numbers, but the but the r-value is the product of the two r-values. That rule we could write as r1 cosine theta 1 plus r1 i sine theta 1 times r2 cosine theta 2 plus r2 i sine theta 2. And we know that it should equal r1 r2 cosine theta 1 plus theta 2 plus r1 r2 i times sine theta 1 plus theta 2. And I want to show you another way. This one involves trigonometry. A lot of people like this other way better. I, I just do FOIL on these. I get r1 r2 cosine theta 1 cosine theta 2 plus the outers r1 r2 i cosine theta 1 sine theta 2 plus the inners r1 r2 i sine theta 1 cosine theta 2 and a little more room plus for the last r1 r2 i squared sine theta 1 sine theta 2 this i squared is the same thing as negative 1 so I'll put a minus there now, I'm going to take this term that has no i in it and this term that now has no i in it and group those together. And I'm also going to factor out the r1, r2. And I get cosine theta 1, cosine theta 2, minus sine theta 1, sine theta 2. On the other hand, we've got these two guys. They have i in them. So I'll factor out the r1, r2, and group those together, and the i. And I get cosine theta, cosine theta 1, sine theta 2, plus sine theta 1, cosine theta 2. Well, this here, you may recognize, is the sum of, sine a, of cosine a plus b. Cosine A plus B is cosine A, cosine B minus sine A, sine B. So this is the same thing, so it turns into this. Whereas this thing, sine A plus B is sine A, cosine B plus cosine A, sine B. So this thing in the parentheses can be replaced with sine A plus B, or in this case, sine theta 1 plus theta 2. And that's the trigonometry uh, proof. We also have this one that doesn't rely on trigonometry.